Saturday Night Theatre. We present Sybil Thorndyke with Jill Balkan and Carlton Hobbs in The Sacred Flame by Somerset Maugham, adapted for radio by Peter Watts. It's a spring evening. In the drawing room of the Tabrits' house outside London are Mrs. Tabrit and her invalid son Morris, who's playing chess with his doctor, and Nurse Wayland. The Sacred Flame. Speed is the essence of chess, old boy. Hmm. Don't let the brute bully me, Mrs. Tabrit. I think you are quite capable of taking care of yourself, Doctor. Besides, how can anyone bully effectively from an invalid bed? If you moved your bishop, you'd make things a bit awkward for me. Now, how on earth do you expect poor Nurse Wayland to read when you never for an instant hold your tongue? I can't even hear myself tatting. I don't mind, Mrs. Tabrit. Don't bother about me. After listening to my sprightly conversation for nearly five years, Nurse Wayland pays no more attention to me than if I were a deaf mute. Well, who can blame her? Even when pain and anguish wring my brow and I swear like 50,000 troopers, I never managed to bring the blush of shame to her maiden cheek. <laughs> I know. It's exasperating. <laughs> it's worse than that, Nurse. It's inconsiderate. <laughs> it would relieve me to see you blench with horror. Oh, watch the doctor. He's about to move. Very careful, old boy. The position is fraught with danger. I'm going to move my knight. Hmm. What would you say if I gave that little pawn a push and murmured check? Well, I should say it was your right, but I should think it a trifle vulgar. And do you know what I do now in your place? No, I don't. I'd catch my foot in the leg of the table and kick it over accidentally. <laughs> That's the only way you can save yourself from getting the worst hiding I've ever given you. Go to the devil. There. Oh. You do that, do you? Mm-hmm. All right. Oh. If you please, ma'am, Major Laconda wants to know if it's too late for him to come in and have a drink. Of course not. Where is he? He's at the door, sir. Well, ask him to come in. Very good, ma'am. You uh, know him, don't you, Doctor? No. He's the fellow who's just taken that furnished house on the golf links, isn't he? Yes, I knew him years ago in India. That's why he came here. He was one of Mother's numerous admirers. <laughs> I understand that she treated him rather badly. <laughs> I can well believe it. <laughs> Does he still cherish a hopeless passion for you, Mrs. Tabrit? I don't know at all, Dr. Harvester. You'd better ask him. Was he Indian Army? No, he was a policeman. He's just retired. He's a very good chap, and I believe he's rather a good golfer. My brother Colin has played with him two or three times. Well, I asked him to dine tonight so that Morris could get a game of bridge, but he couldn't come. Major Laconda. How do you do? How very nice of you to look in. I was on my way home and saw that your lights were on, so I thought I'd just ask if anyone would like to give me a duck and Irish. Mm. Help yourself. The whiskey's on the table. Oh, thank you. Oh, how are you, nurse? How do you do? And the patient? Bearing up pretty well, considering all he has to put up with. <laughs> You're in your usual high spirits. <laughs> I don't think you know Dr. Harvester. I do. Mrs. Tabry tells me you're a very good doctor. Well, I take great pains to impress the fact on my patients. His only serious fault is that he thinks he can play chess. Oh, don't let me disturb your game. Oh, it's, it's finished. Not at all. I have three possible moves. What do you say to that? Mate, you poor fish. Hmm? Damn. Have you beaten him? Hollow. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, shall I put the chess things away? Hmm, if you wouldn't mind. Oh, I won't keep you up. I'll just swallow my drink and take myself off. I really only came to say I was sorry I couldn't come to dinner. Well, there's no hurry, you know. I'm not going to bed for hours. Well, we're really waiting up for Stella and Colin. They've gone to the opera. I'm a night owl. I never go to bed till I can help it. You're the man for my money. I've got a day's work before me. I'll just have a drop of scotch to assuage the pangs of defeat, and then I must run. Major, let's send the rest of them off to bed and have a good old gossip by ourselves. Hmm? I'm willing. Well, if you really want to stay up, Morris, let Nurse Whalen get you ready. And then you've only just got to slip into bed. And Colin can help you. All right. What do you say to that, Nurse? Well, it's just as you like. I'm quite prepared to stay up until Mrs. Morris comes in. I'll put you to bed after you've said goodnight to her. No, come on. You're looking tired. You know, you're looking a little peaked, Nurse. 
I think it's nearly time you had another holiday. Oh, I don't want another holiday for months. Put your shoulder to the wheel, nurse, and gently trundle the wounded hero to his bedchamber. Oh. Oh. Oh, shall I come and help? Uh, no, not in your life. It's bad enough to be messed about by one person. I don't want a crowd, damn it. Sorry. We shall be back in ten minutes. She seems a very nice woman, that nurse. Yes. She's extremely competent, and I must say she's very gentle and kind. You've had her ever since poor mm. Morris crashed, haven't you? Oh, no. We had three or four before she came. Oh. All more or less odious. She's a rattling good nurse. I think you're lucky to have got her. Yes, I'm sure we are. The only fault I have to find with her is that she's so very reserved. She's been with us all day and every day for nearly five years, and I only just know that her name is Beatrice. She calls the boys Mr. Morris and Mr. Colin, and Stella, she calls Mrs. Morris. She certainly doesn't encourage familiarity. <laughs> I can't imagine skylarking with her at a Sunday school treat, I must <laughs> admit. Of course, she's a little tactless. It never seems to occur to her that Morris wants to be alone with his wife. Poor lamb, he has so little... He likes to say goodnight to Stella, the last thing, and he likes to say it without anyone looking on. And Nurse Whalen seems to find something to do just at that last moment. That's why he's staying up now. But, good Lord, why don't you tell her? But she's terribly sensitive. Haven't you noticed how often rather tactless people are? They'll stamp on your toes, and then when you tuck them up out of harm's way, they're so offended. I suppose Morris is absolutely dependent upon Oh, her. absolutely. All sorts of rather unpleasant things have to be done for him, poor dear, and he can't bear that anyone should know about them, especially Stella. Yes, I've discovered that. He doesn't want Stella to have anything to do with his illness. Doctor, is there really no chance of his getting better? I'm afraid not. It's a miracle that he's alive at all. He was terribly smashed up, you know. The lower part of his spine was broken, and the plane caught fire and he was badly burnt. His courage amazes me. He never seems low or depressed. No, never. His spirits are wonderful. It's one of the most anguishing things I know to see him when he's in pain and there are beads of sweat on his brow force a joke from his lips. Uh, I'm sorry Colin is going away so soon, Mrs. Tebrit. I think his being here has done Morris a lot of good. You know, when they were boys, they were great friends. And, you know, brothers aren't always. <laughs> They're not indeed. And Colin has been away so long. He went to Central America just before Morris crashed, you know. He put all his share of his father's money in a coffee plantation, and it's doing very well. He loves the life out there. And it seems cruel to ask him to give it up to help us look after his crippled brother. Oh, I think it would be very unfair. One has no right to ask anyone to give up his own chance of making the best he can of life. At all events, with the young one may ask, but the likelihood of their consenting is very slight. Not at all, Mrs. Tabret. The country is full of desiccated females who have given up their lives to taking care of an invalid mother. When I was at Bath, I saw a good many couples like that. And to tell you the truth, I sometimes wondered why the daughters didn't murder their mothers. Oh, well, they often do. <laughs> Every doctor's had a case where he has a strong suspicion that some old woman who lived too long has been poisoned by her relatives. And he takes jolly good care not to say anything about it. Why? Oh, it's rotten for a man's practice. Nothing can do you so much damage as to be mixed up in a murder case. You know, I often pondered over the problem of the woman who, like myself, was no longer young and suffers from indifferent health. I'm not sure if the best way of dealing with us wouldn't be to do as some African tribes do. At a certain age, take us to the river's brim and push us gently but firmly <laughs> in. Well, what happens if they can <laughs> swim? Well, the families stand on the banks with brick bats and take pot shots at their struggling with aged grandmother. Oh, no. <laughs> that discourages her efforts to get out. <laughs> uh, here uh. I'm all fixed up and ready for any excitement. Oh, I must go. Yes, and Nurse Whalen should go to bed. Are you sure Mrs. Morris and your brother won't go and have supper after the opera? I'm sure they will. Then they won't be home till four. Does that mean you disapprove of my staying up, you hard and brutal woman? Doesn't Dr. Harvester? Oh, very much. 
But I'm aware that Morris has no intention of going to sleep till he knows his wife is safely home again, and my theory is that it only does people good now and then to do what they shouldn't. Ah, that's the kind of doctor for me. What's that? What, Morris? I thought I heard a car. Yes, by Jove, it's Stella. Do you mean to say you can hear from this distance? You bet your life I can. Yes, that's the family bus. Well, I must go. No, no, just stay a minute and see Stella. She's got her best bib and tucker on and she's a sight for sore eyes. Oh, by the way, what were they giving at the opera tonight? Tristan. That's why I insisted on Stella's going. It was after Tristan that we got engaged. Do you remember, Mother? Of course I do. We'd all been to hear it and then we went on to supper. I drove Stella around Regent's Park in a little two-seater I had then and I swore I'd go on driving round and round till she promised to marry me. (laughs) <laughs> Tristan had given her such an appetite that by the time we were halfway round the second time, she said, Oh, well, if I must either marry you or die of starvation, I'd sooner marry you. <laughs> <laughs> is there a word of truth in this story, Mrs. Tebrett? Well, all I know is that the rest of us had only just ordered our supper when they came in looking like a pair of cats who'd swallowed a canary and said they were engaged. <laughs> Stella? Darling, have you missed me? Why are you back already, you wretched girl? Colin, why didn't you drag her off to have supper? Sorry, old boy, I couldn't do anything about it. I was so thrilled by the opera. I felt I simply couldn't eat a thing. Oh, hang it all. You might have gone to Lucien's and had a dance or two and a bottle of bubbly. What's the good of my buying you a new dress when you won't let anyone see it? (laughs) Major, she said it was too dressed up to go to the opera in. But I exercised my marital authority and made her. Quite right, too. (laughs) Darling, I wanted to show it off in the intervals, but I hadn't the nerve and I kept my cloak on. Well, take it off now and show the gentlemen. The only way I managed to get them to stay was by promising a look at your new dress when you came home. What nonsense. As if Major Le Condor or Dr. Harvester knew one frock from another. Oh, don't be so damned contemptuous of the male sex, Stella. Take off your cloak and let's have a good look at you. You brute, Morris. You've made me feel shy now. Stand up. It's lovely. (sighs) Hello. What's the matter? Stella, what is it? It's nothing. I feel so frightfully faint. Oh, my dear. Uh, Stella. It's all right, Morris. Don't fuss. Now, put your head down between your knees. Let me, Doctor. No, no, don't. Don't touch me. I shall be all right again in a minute. It's silly of me. I'm sorry, darling. It was my fault. It's nothing. I feel better already. Well, my own belief is that she's just faint from lack of food. What time did you dine? We didn't dine. We just had some caviar and half a bottle of champagne before the opera. You're a ridiculous pair. I enjoy Wagner so much more on an empty stomach. I'm really quite all right now. Nurse... Would you mind going to the kitchen and seeing if you can find anything for these silly young things to eat? Of course not. There ought to be some ham. I'll make them some sandwiches. Colin, get a bottle of champagne out of the cellar. All right, Mother. I'll see if there's any ice. I've got a thirst I wouldn't sell for 20 pounds. Well, I'll say goodbye. I'm sorry you're feeling poorly, Stella. I shall be all right when I've had something to eat. I think Mother's quite right. What I want is a large ham sandwich with a lot of mustard on it. You're looking better, you know. Just for a moment, you were as white as a sheet. Well, goodbye. Goodbye. It was so nice of you to look in. I'll just stay a moment or two longer, if you don't mind. I don't trust these young women who don't feed themselves properly. Well, let's take a turn in the garden, shall we, Doctor? <laughs> it's so warm and lovely. Yes, come on. And I hope Nurse Wayland has the sense to cut a sandwich for me, too. Darling. I'm sorry I made such a fool of myself. You scared the life out of me, you little beast. <laughs> Why didn't you go on to some place and have a bite before you came home? I wanted to get back. You didn't go on to dance because you thought I should be waiting up for you? Don't hmm? be an old silly. You don't imagine I care a hang about dancing? Oh, you little liar. How can anyone dance as well as you without being crazy about <laughs> it? You're the best dancer I ever danced with. Oh, but I'm not so young as I was. You're 28, only a girl. You ought to be having the time of your life. Nonsense. Oh, my dear. It is rotten for you. Darling, don't talk like that. I married you because I loved you. What a foul brute I should be if I stopped loving you now that you want my love more than ever. Oh, my dear. We can't 
love because we ought to. Love comes and goes, and we can none of us help ourselves. Horace, what do you mean? Has there been anything to lead you to think that I wasn't the same as I've always been? <laughs> no, darling. You've been angelic always. <gasps> but well, what's the matter? You suddenly went quite white. You're not feeling faint again? No, I'm all right. You know, if I've seemed often to take things for granted, you mustn't think I'm not conscious all the time how much I owe you. That's very silly of you, my pet. Hmm? I don't know that I've done anything for you at all, except be moderately civil. You've never let me. I've never let you nurse me. No, not in your life. My precious, I don't want you to smell of antiseptics. I want you to smell of the dawn. I'm so grateful to you, Stella. Maurice. You know that I'm never going to get well, Stella, don't you? I don't indeed. It's a long business, we know that. But I'm absolutely convinced that you'll get at all events very much better. They tell me that one of these days they'll try operating again to see if they can't possibly put me right. But I know they're lying. They pretend they can do something in order to give me hope. And I pretend to believe them because it's the easiest thing to do. I know I'm here for life, Stella. Then let's take what comfort we can in the great joy we've had in one another. In the days when you were well and strong. I shall always be grateful for the happiness you gave me and for your love. Do you think that's changed? No. I love you as deeply, as devotedly as I ever did. I'm not often silly and sentimental, am I, Stella? Is it so silly to be sentimental? No, you're not often. You're everything in the world to me, Stella. People have been most awfully kind to me, and it, it's not till you're crocked up as I am that you find out how kind people are. But there's not one of them that I wouldn't see in hell if it would save you from unhappiness or trouble. Well, I wouldn't tell them if I were you. I don't believe they'd awfully like it. I ought to be frightened because I'm so dependent on you. But I'm not. Because I know, not just with my mind or my heart, but with every nerve in me, how good you are. How Darling, you really are exaggerating. If you go on like this, I, I shall send you to your room. <laughs> My precious. You can laugh at me, but I see the tears in your lovely eyes. Horace, I'm a very weak, a very imperfect and a very sinful woman. You silly little ass. Why are you saying all this to me just tonight? I should never have mentioned it, only I, I wanted to tell you that it's... You have given me the courage to carry on. Oh, I'm not unhappy. I don't know how many years I shall hang on, but if you'll help me, darling, I think I can make a pretty good job of it. <laughs> I owe everything to you. Nothing matters to me very much when I know I shall see you tomorrow and the next day and the day after that and always... Morris, I'm unworthy of such love. I'm so ashamed. I'm so selfish. I'm so thoughtless. Never. Why did you make me go out tonight? Did you think it was any pleasure to me? I didn't care. I was thinking of my pleasure. I wanted you to hear again the music we'd heard together that night we got engaged. Do you remember how you cried in the second act when Tristan and Isolde sing that duet of theirs and I held your hand in the dark? I cried because I loved you and I was happy. Did you cry tonight? I don't know. You know, that music is stunning, isn't it? People seem to think it's above the average. You seem to carry it still in your eyes when you came in. Oh, they were bright and shining. They were like grey, deep pools of light. You've never looked so beautiful as you look tonight. You, you made the Venus de Milo look like a lump of cheese. <laughs> go on, darling. I can bear much more in the same strain. I could go on for weeks. No. Then I'd be afraid you were prejudiced. Go on till the sandwiches come in. Give me your hands. No, I won't. Let's be sensible and, and talk about what's going to win the Grand National. Of course, the honest truth is that you're ever so much lovelier than when I married you. What is there that gives you this sudden new radiance? I don't know why I should look any different from usual. I watch your face. 
I know every change in it from day to day. A year ago, you had a strained, almost a hunted look. But now, lately, you've had an air that's strangely peaceful. You've gained a sort of beautiful serenity. My poor lamb. I'm afraid that can only be due to advancing years. Soon you'll discover the first wrinkle on my forehead, and then the first white hair. No, 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 you must never grow old. I couldn't bear it. How cruel to think that all that beauty... No, don't, Morris. Please. It would have been better for both of us if I'd been killed when I crashed. I'm no use to you. I'm no use to anybody. Morris, how can you say that? Don't you know how desperately afraid I was when they told me you were hurt? And how relieved, how infinitely thankful when they told me at last that you would live. They should never have let me. Why didn't they put me out of my misery? They had only wanted an injection, a little stronger than usual. Yes, that was the cruelty, to bring me back to life. Cruel to me and ten times more cruel to you. I won't let you say it. It's not true. It's not true. I think I could have borne it if we'd had a child. Oh, Stella, if we'd only had one, I could think to myself that it was you and me. And you would have something to console you. After all, it's a woman's destiny to have children. You wouldn't have felt that you'd entirely wasted your life. But, Morris, my dear, I don't feel I've wasted my life. You're not yourself tonight. You're ill and tired. What's come over you? I I love you, Stella. I wanted to take you in my arms as I used to. I want to press my lips to yours and see your eyes close and your head fall back and feel your dear, soft body grow tense. Oh, Stella. Stella. I I can't bear it. Morris, darling. Don't. Don't cry. (laughs) I can't. what What a damned fool I am. Give me a handkerchief. Here. My dear, you did frighten me. It's it's what they call a, a nerve storm. It's it's lucky it was only you here. It would have been a pretty kettle of fish if Nurse Wayland had seen me like that. It would have been a much prettier kettle of fish if I'd seen you clinging to her. I so say you... You haven't got a mirror, have you? My angel, how do you imagine I apply lipstick? Here. Hmm. For an intrepid aviator, I look rather tear-stained, if I may say so. Let me powder your nose, then. You can't think what a comfort it is after you've been upset. Oh, go on with you. No, you, you can give me a whiskey and soda, if you like. All right, but I'll powder mine. I feel like a house on fire now. I wish someone would explain to me how it is that a dab of powder can, in the twinkling of an eye, reduce a woman's nose from an unwieldy lump to a dear little thing that no one can deny is her best feature. These are the miracles of science that we read about. Now I'll get your whiskey and soda. Ah, here's Colin. I'll have a glass of champagne instead. I'm afraid I've been an awful time. I knew you couldn't be trusted in the cellar by yourself. We were just going to send a search party after you. Well, first I couldn't find anything to break the ice with, and then I couldn't find the nippers to cut the wire. Mm. Then I thought I might as well put the car away. I didn't want to leave it outside all night. Meanwhile, Stella is famishing. Nurse Wayne is just coming. She's making some sandwiches with grilled bacon. They smell a fair treat. Here she is. That is kind of you, nurse. If there's anything I adore, it's bacon sandwiches. I haven't brought any knives and forks. I I thought you could eat with your fingers. Heavenly. I just bolt up and change my coat. Well, I'm not going to wait for you. All right, go right ahead. But but leave me my fair share, or else all is over between us. (laughs) Where are the others? Dr. Harvester, come and eat a sandwich before it gets cold. I I don't think I'll wait to see you people make pigs of yourselves. I, I think I'll turn in. Aren't you going to have a drink with us? I don't think I will, if you don't mind. I'm I'm rather tired. Oh, I'm sorry, Morris. But there's nothing to stay up for if you're tired. I'll wheel you to your room. You might look in on your way up to bed, Stella. Yes, rather. But I shan't disturb you if you're asleep. I shan't be asleep. I've got a bit of a head. I'll just lie still in the dark. It'll go away. Did I hear you calling there? You did. Morris is going to bed. 
Oh, I'm so glad. It's fearfully late. Good night, old boy. Sleep well. Good night, Mother. Bless you. Well, let me give you a hand, nurse. Oh, I can manage perfectly, thank you. I'm so used to wheeling the invalid bed, and he weighs nothing. Never mind. Let me push him in. I'd like to. Oh, let the man do something for his money, nurse. You bring me drops and me powder puff, dearie. Don't be long, doctor, or the sandwiches will be stone cold. Well... Morris is rather nervy tonight. Yes, I noticed it. I'm sorry I went to the opera. Oh, my dear, you go out so little. I haven't the inclination, really. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid you're awfully tired. Dead. Why don't you eat something? No, I'll wait till the others come. Whatever happens, darling, I want you to know that I'm deeply grateful for all that you have done for Morris. Why do you say that? You don't think he's any worse? No, I think he's just about the same as usual. You startled me. I don't know why you should suddenly say a thing like that. Mm -hmm. Is there any reason why I shouldn't? It sounded strangely ominous. Well, I feel I'd like you to know that I realise what a great sacrifice you've made for him for so many years. You mustn't think that I've taken it as a matter of course. Oh, don't. Don't. If there was anything I could do to make things a little easier for Morris, I was anxious to do it. After all, you didn't marry him to be the helpmate of a hopeless cripple. One takes the rough with the smooth. Well, you're a very young and very beautiful woman. You have the right to live your life just as everyone else has. For six years now, you've given up everything to be the sole comfort of a man who is your husband only because a legal ceremony has joined you together. No. No, because love has joined us together. Oh, my poor child, I'm so desperately sorry for you. Whatever the future may have in store, I shall never forget your courage, your self-sacrifice, and your patience. I don't understand what you mean. Don't you? Hello. Where are the others? Morris has gone to bed. Dr. Harvest is just coming. Now, come on, children, and sit down and have something to eat. I'll pour out some wine, shall I? Mmm. Lovely sandwiches. Nurse Whelan makes them very well, doesn't she? Mmm, marvellously. Oh, Doctor, if you don't hurry up, you'll be too late. Mm. I'll just have a sandwich and swallow one glass and bolt. It's only old time, and I've got to be up bright and early in the morning. Is Morris all right? Oh, fairly. He's a bit down tonight for some reason. I don't know why. He was in great spirits earlier in the evening. Oh, I expect he's just tired. He would sit up. He says he's got a headache. I've left him a sleeping draught that he can... Take if he can't get off or wakes in the night and feels restless. I'll go in and see him before I go to bed. If he can only get a good rest, I'm sure he'll be his usual self tomorrow. Sit with him a little, Stella. Of course I will. Well, I must be off. Good night, Mrs. Tabard. I've had a jolly evening. Well, I'll come and see you to the door. Then I shall go up to bed. Thank you. Good night, children. Good night. Good night, Colin, dear. And don't stay up too late, either of you. And put out the lights and see that the windows are properly closed and the safety catches in place. (laughs) I will, Mother. You see how these boys treat me? They've no respect for their aged mother. (laughs) Certain amount of restrained affection, however. Oh, bless you, my dears, now and always. Uh, Good night. Good night, Doctor. We shall see you in a day or two, I suppose. Oh, I expect so. Good night, Doctor. I'll see you out. Stella. Stella. Oh, Colin. Oh, my poor darling. What shall I do? Colin, what have we done? Darling. Morris was so strange tonight, I couldn't make him out. I was almost afraid he suspected. Impossible. He must never know. Never. I'd do anything in the world to prevent it. I'm so terribly sorry. We're in a hopeless past. Hopeless. Why did you ever love me? Why did I ever love you? Stella. Oh, I'm so ashamed. Major Laconda. Oh, how do you do? 
My dear boy, what an awful thing. I'm absolutely horrified. I've only just this minute heard. It's nice of you to have come. I've been playing golf. Someone told me at the clubhouse when I got in. I could hardly believe it. I'm afraid it's true all the same. But Morris seemed comparatively well last night. <sighs> Anyhow, no worse than usual. I thought him in such good spirits. He was full of fun. He was cracking jokes. Yes, I know. Well, Blake came up when I was standing at the bar and said to me, I say, have you heard that poor Morris Tabret died last night? By George, it gave me a shock. You know, when one isn't as young as one was, it always gives one a turn. I suppose it does. Blake hadn't heard any of the details. Was he taken suddenly worse in the night? No, he said he was rather tired. It was getting a bit late, you know. He seemed all right, though. Did he just die in his sleep? I suppose so. Ah, that's the best way, isn't it? We'd all give something to know for certain that when our time came, we'd pass out like that. He can't have felt ill, or he'd have rung. There's a bell push under his pillow, and it rings in Nurse Whalen's room. She'd have been down like a flash if there'd been a sound. She heard nothing? Nothing. When did she find out, then? Well, you see, sometimes if he'd had a poorish night, he slept rather late in the morning... And he was always allowed to sleep on. Yes. You know what nurses are. However rotten a night you've had, they come bustling in at the crack of dawn. You must be washed and have your hair brushed. Oh, don't and... I know it. I never know which I dread most, an attack of malaria or a really efficient nurse. <laughs> yes, but Nurse Whalen's really a very good sort. Huh? Oh, I know. It struck me that she was a thoroughly nice girl. Yes, but when she first came, she wanted to get Morris ready for the day, as she called it, at eight o'clock every morning. Well... Stella put her foot down. She said she didn't want to interfere with anything else, but on that point she insisted. And Nurse Whalen could either knuckle under or go. Quite right, but go on. Well, we were just finishing breakfast this morning when Nurse Whalen came in. I noticed she was very white. She said she'd just been in to Morris. Stella got right up on her hind legs. I won't have it, she said. I've forbidden you to go in till he rings. I've never seen Stella in such a passion. I saw Nurse Wayne and was trembling. She looked all funny, scared, you know. But not of Stella. Is anything the matter, Nurse? I asked. She gave a sort of cry and clenched her hands. I'm afraid he's dead. She said, Good Lord, how awful. Stella gave a sort of gasp and then went into a dead faint. Oh, your poor mother. Mother was wonderful. You know how when half a dozen things happen at a time, you seem to see them all separately and yet together. Yes. I sprang forward to help Stella. And I saw Mother sitting at the table with a piece of toast in her hand. She never made a sound. She seemed all of a sudden to become an old, old woman. But why didn't the fool break it to you more gently? Then Mother stood up. She got hold of herself quicker than any of us. I never knew she had such nerve. Oh, she's a woman in a thousand. I know that. You'd better go for Dr. Harvester. She said to me, I'll never get the sound of her voice out of my ears. Hold on, old man. It's no good you going to pieces. Don't tell me any more if it upsets you. No, no, I'm all right. Uh, so I got the car and brought him back with me. He said he thought poor Morris had been dead for a good two hours. Did he say what had happened? Thinks it may have been an embolism or perhaps heart failure. How about Stella? She's all right, thank heaven. But did she give me a fright? I don't wonder. Harvester wanted her to go to bed, but she wouldn't. She's in Morris's room now. But what about your mother? Harvester's with her. He he had to go and see some patients, but he came back again just before you arrived. Ah, here he is. Hello, Major. This is a very sad business, Doctor. Well, it's naturally been a dreadful shock to Mrs. Tabret and Stella. How is Mrs. Tabret? Well, she's bearing up wonderfully. She's very much upset, but she's trying not to show it. I wonder if she'd like to see me. I'm sure she would. Shall I run up and see? It would be very kind of you, Colin. Oh, say that if she doesn't want to be bothered with me, she has only to say so. I shall quite understand. All right. You know, I've known Mrs. Tabret for over 30 years. Her husband was in the Indian Civil. 
Yes, you told me. They were almost the first people I got to know at all well when I went out to India. She's one of the best, you know. She always was. Everybody liked her. Well, of course, I've seen a good deal of her during the last five years. She's really been wonderful. So is Stella, for that matter. I could wish the end hadn't come quite so suddenly. Oh, why? It's much better that he should have passed out like that rather than get inflammation of the lungs or something of that sort that he just hadn't the strength to fight against. Oh, so far as he was concerned, yes, I was thinking of his mother and Stella. Oh, hello, nurse. I thought you were having a rest. Good morning, nurse. Good morning, Major. I'm glad you came round. Mrs. Tabret will be glad to see you. I told you to go and lie down, nurse. I couldn't. I was too restless. I'm afraid it's been as great a shock to Nurse Wayland as to the rest of us. After all, you've been looking after Morris for a long time. Yes, it's been a great shock to me. He was a dear. One couldn't help admiring him. He bore his terrible misfortune with so much courage. He was splendid. There's no doubt about that. I naturally grew attached to him. He was always so gay and so grateful for what one did for him. I suppose you'll try to get a good long holiday before you take another job. I haven't made any plans yet. To tell you the truth, you're looking all in. Oh, am I? Now, you must try not to take it too hard. A nurse naturally doesn't like to lose a patient, especially so unexpectedly. Well, it was always on the cards that he'd go out suddenly. Like a candle that you blow out when you don't want it anymore. Where does the flame go then? My dear, I'm afraid you're taking poor Morris's death a good deal more to heart than is quite wise. Did you think he was only a case to me? Even a nurse is human. Strange as it may seem, she has a heart like other people. Of course she has a heart. But it doesn't do her or her patients any good if she allows her emotions to get the better of her common sense. Does that mean you think I've been inefficient? Of course not. Heaven knows you never spared yourself. Well... Perhaps you've been trying to do a little too much for your strength. Now, you take my advice, my dear, and go for a holiday. What you want is a real rest. What is it, in your opinion, that Maurice Tabrit actually died of? Heart failure. Everybody dies of heart failure. Of course. But that's as good a thing as any to put on the death certificate. Are you going to have a post-mortem? No. Why should I? It's quite unnecessary. I don't agree with you. I'm sorry, but it's my affair. If I'm prepared to sign the death certificate, I don't know that anyone else has any right to say anything about it. You've told me half a dozen times that Maurice Tabret might have lived for years. So he might. I can tell you now that it's a blessing for everybody concerned with him that he didn't. Dr. Harvester, Maurice Tabret was murdered. What are you talking about? Do you want me to repeat it? Maurice Tabret was murdered. Rubbish. I dare say you're not quite yourself this morning, nurse. It's very natural, but you must try to be reasonable. You oughtn't to say things that you can't possibly mean. I'm in complete possession of my senses, Major Laconda, and I know perfectly well what I'm saying. Do you mean to say that you intended that statement to be taken literally? Quite. It's a very serious one, you know. I'm aware of that. It's grotesque. You've known me for five years, Dr. Harvester. Have I ever given you to imagine that I'm a neurotic or hysterical woman, given to talking in a wild and exaggerated way? No, but... Now, let's listen to what Nurse Wayland has to say. Do you mean by any chance that you're dissatisfied with the way your patient was treated by Dr. Harvester? By George, that never occurred to me. Is that it, Nurse? Now, don't hesitate to say anything you want to. I shan't be in the least offended. So far as I could judge, you did everything for Maurice Tabret that medical skill could do. Well, Nurse Will. I'm a trained nurse, Major Leconda. You can't imagine that if Maurice Tabret had died as the result of an error in treatment on Dr. Harvester's part, I should be so heartless as to distress the relatives by mentioning it. Oh, I, I don't want to seem flippant on such an occasion, but I am forced to say that your magnanimity overwhelms me, Nurse Will. You can be flippant or condescending or sarcastic, Dr. Harvester. It means nothing to me. I'm sure it'll do no harm if we're all civil to one another, at least for a little while longer. I've made a definite charge, and I stick to it. The charge being that some person or persons unknown murdered Maurice Tablet. Yes, Oh, but, my dear, why should anyone want to murder poor Maurice? That, at present, is no business of mine. Now, look here, nurse. 
You know just as well as I do that everyone connected with him was devoted to Morris. No one was ever more surrounded with love and affection than he was. It's incredible that anyone should even have wished him harm. Whatever I may think or may not think, I am at liberty to keep to myself. I am not in the witness box. The witness box? Do you already see yourself giving sensational evidence at the Old Bailey? I can honestly say that I can imagine nothing more hateful than the notoriety if I were obliged to appear in court. Well, there'd be notoriety, all right. Oh, come now, Nurse Wayland. You know just as well as I do that Morris died of natural causes. What on earth is the use of making a fuss and getting everyone... If he died of natural causes, a post-mortem will prove it, and then I shall have nothing more to say. I'm not going to have a post-mortem. You know how the relatives hate it. Are you afraid of what it will show? Of course not. I warn you that if you sign the death certificate, I shall go straight to the coroner and make a protest. I should have thought the Tebrits had had enough to put up with. Major Leconda, you were in the Indian police, weren't you? Yes, I was. You ought to know about such things. Will you tell me what is the duty of a nurse who has reason to believe that her patient has come to his death by foul play? I suppose her duty is quite clear. But I think she should be very sure that her reasons are valid before she exposes to distress and publicity a family that has treated her with unvarying kindness. What are your reasons, anyway? You've made a charge, but to the best of my recollection, you haven't given us an inkling of what it's based on. If you'd been willing to have a post-mortem, nothing need have been said till we knew the results of it. But you've put me with my back to the wall. Major Leconda is right. Everyone in this house has treated me with the greatest consideration. I do owe it to them to make no charges that may concern them behind their backs. Well, does that mean you want them sent for? Please. I think it's best. You've been so definite, Nurse Whelan, that neither Dr. Harvester nor I can keep the matter to ourselves. However distressing it may be, I think Morris's family should know what you have to say. I'm quite prepared to tell them. In point of fact, I think Mrs. Tabret is just coming. Where is Stella? Do you want her to? I think it's better. Well, I'll see if I can find her. I believe she's in Morris's room. Don't judge me till you've heard all I have to say, Major Leconda. Miss Wayland, I happen to be a very old friend of the Tabrits and deeply attached to Mrs. Tabrit. I regret that you should think it your duty at this moment of all others to add to their great sorrow. I can only hope that you'll be shown not to have been justified. In that case, you will have good reason to throw me out of the house bag and baggage. It's not my house, Miss Wayland. And I doubt whether Colin Tabret would be willing to depute to me that pleasant task. I'm just as glad to know who are my friends and who are my enemies. Here's Mother. My dear old friend. I felt that I must come and see you for a moment, my dear. I'm sure you know how deeply I sympathize with you. But I wanted to tell you that if in any way I can be of service to it you... It was you... very kind of you to come, and just like you. I'm relieved to see that you're bearing so bravely what must have been a bitter blow. Well, I'm trying to put my own feelings away, out of sight and mind. I want only to think that my son has ended his long martyrdom. He was not meant to live on a bed of sickness. I will not weep because he is dead. I will rejoice because he is free. Here she is, Major. Dr. Harvester told me you were here and wanted to see me. Stella, I wanted first of all to tell you how much I feel for you in your sad loss. Thank you, Major. Morris was never afraid of death. He didn't attach very much importance to it. He told me that he didn't wish me to wear mourning for him. He wanted me to go about and do things exactly as if he were alive. Mm, he loved you so much, Stella. He put your happiness above everything. I know. Those lines of Stevenson's keep ringing in my ears. Home is the sailor, home from sea. And the hunter, home from the hill. <laughs> They're very moving to us who've spent our lives in distant places. You'll be leaving us very soon now, I suppose, nurse? I suppose so. I want to thank you for everything you did for Morris. And I want you to know how deeply grateful I am to you. I did no more than my duty. Oh, no. You did much more than that. If it had been only your duty, you could never have anticipated Morris's wants. Your husband was a very easy patient. He was always anxious not to give trouble. I've... I've got a little plan that I wanted to tell you about. 
I've talked it over with Mrs. Tabris, and she very much approves of it. You've had a long and hard time here, and your month's holiday a year has been very little rest. You've often talked to me about your sister in South Africa, and I know how much you've wanted to travel. If you'll allow me, I should like to make it possible for you to go out there and have a good time. I don't think I understand what you mean. Well, my dear, a nurse's salary is never very large. I know that Morris has left me everything he had, and it would be dear of you if you would let me make you a present of a few hundred pounds so that you could go for a nice long journey and need not think of earning your living for a while. Do you think that I would take money from you? Is that what you take me for? But what on earth is the harm of it? Come, nurse, don't be unreasonable. You know I don't want to offend you. What I've done, I've been paid for. If I wasn't satisfied with the payment I received, I only had to go. Nurse, what is the matter? What have I said? You mustn't take what Nurse Whalen says too literally. She really isn't herself today. No, Harvester, it's no good taking up that attitude. The position is much too serious. Stella. Yes? I've got something very unpleasant to tell you. I would sooner not have added to your present trouble, but I'm afraid it can't be avoided. What is it? Nurse Wayland is not satisfied that Morris died from heart failure. But if Dr. Harvitter says so, surely he knows best. I am prepared to sign the death certificate. I have no doubt in my mind of the cause of death. Nurse Wayland thinks there ought to be a post-mortem. Never. Never. Poor Morris's body has suffered enough. I won't have him cut about to satisfy an idle curiosity. I absolutely refuse. I understand that an autopsy cannot be held except with the consent of the next of kin. Or on the order of the coroner. What does she mean by that? I'm afraid she means that if you persist in your refusal, she'll go to the proper authority and make the statement she has already made to Dr. Harvester and me. What is this statement? Do you wish to repeat it, Nurse Wayland? Not particularly. I have no objection to your doing so. Do you really insist on going through with this, nurse? What you said to the Major and me was more or less confidential, wasn't it? If anything further is said, the matter must necessarily go out of our control. I think you should consider the consequences of your attitude and the harm that may arise. I can't keep silent. I should never forgive myself. Nurse Whalen states that Morris's death was not due to his illness, but to some other cause. I'm dreadfully sorry, but I don't understand. What other cause could have brought about his death? She says he was murdered. Murdered? Oh, Morris, Morris. You must be mad, nurse. Harvester and I have pointed out to her that he was regarded by everyone connected with him with the greatest affection. But it's preposterous. After the first shock, I'm almost inclined to laugh. Really, nurse, you must be very nervous and overwrought to have got such an idea in your head. Is that why you were so funny when I asked you to take a year's holiday? I had no wish that the matter should go so far now. If Dr. Harvester had agreed to my suggestion of having a post-mortem, nothing need have been said till it was discovered if my suspicions were justified or not. Hmm. Willing to wound and yet afraid to strike, Nurse Wayland? You forced me into this position, Dr. Harvester. I only did my duty in telling you my very grave suspicions. And the moment I did, you took up a definitely hostile attitude towards me. Well... If you want to know, I thought you silly, nervous and hysterical. Good heavens, I've been in practice long enough to know how wildly people talk. I should be kept pretty busy if I paid any attention, for instance, to what one woman says about another. Or is it that you're frightened to death of a scandal? You know that notoriety does a doctor no good, and you think it would hurt your practice if anything got into the papers. You don't want to have a post-mortem, because if there is anything, you don't want to know about it. Deny it if you can. Well, I admit I shouldn't welcome publicity, but I can honestly say that if it were my duty, I shouldn't let my own interests stop me from doing it. All that is neither here nor there. Nurse Whalen presumably has some grounds for her statement. Yes, she has. I thought it better she should speak before all concerned. It was my wish to do so. I don't want to do anything underhand. Go on, Nurse Wayland. Mr. Morris often had bouts of sleeplessness. Dr. Harvester had prescribed various sedatives, but he found that chloralin was the one he supported best. That's true, isn't it? Quite true. I explained to Morris the danger of his growing dependent on drugs and begged him not to take a dose without my permission or Nurse Whalen's. I'm quite sure that he never did. So am I. 
He was very sensible and he understood my point. He certainly wasn't lacking in self-control. Will you tell Major Leconda what instructions you gave me last night? He was excited and wrought up. I asked Nurse Whalen to give him a tablet and told him that if he woke in the night, he could take it. I thought he'd probably drop off for half an hour or so and then wake up and not be able to get to sleep again. I dissolved a tablet in half a glass of water and put it by his side. I noticed that there were only five tablets left in the bottle and I made up my mind to order some more. This morning, the bottle was empty. That's very strange. Very. How did you happen to notice? I was tidying up. I... I thought it better to put away all the medicines and dressings and so on. Would five tablets have a fatal effect? Six. I left one dissolved in water by the side of his bed. Yes, there's little doubt that the effect would be fatal. It's all incredible. It's surely much more likely that someone took them for his own use. Are you absolutely sure that last night the bottle contained five tablets? Absolutely. If anyone took them for his own use, it must have been after I went to bed. But no one went into Morris's room last night after that but me. I went in to say good night to him. How do you know that no one else went into his room? Who could have? There was only Colin and Mother. You went upstairs, Millie, as I was letting myself out. Yes, I was very tired. I didn't see any reason to wait while Colin and Stella and the doctor ate a bacon sandwich. And you didn't go into Morris's room last night, Colin? No, why should I? I don't need a sleeping draught to make me sleep. You're not under the impression that I took the tablets, I suppose, Nurse Wayland? <laughs> if you had, you could presumably produce at least four of them. Believe me, if you'd taken 25 grains of chlorolin at midnight, you wouldn't be standing there now. The fact remains that five tablets disappeared last night. Where are they? There's always the possibility that they were taken maliciously by someone who wanted to make trouble. Do you mean me, Dr. Harvester? What do you think I can get out of making trouble? Really, I, I don't know how such a stupid idea can have crossed your mind. Why should I have asked you to have a post-mortem if I knew for certain, as I must if I'd taken the tablets out of sheer malice, that it would discover nothing? Isn't it possible that they could have been taken by somebody this morning? Who? Uh, well, the, the housemaid, for instance. Chorlin is not a very common drug. I shouldn't have thought a housemaid would ever have heard of it. It's not as though it were aspirin. I don't know about that. There have been cases in the papers. It's not safe to take it for granted that a housemaid wouldn't have got into the habit of taking something when she couldn't sleep. Well, it's very easy to make sure. It's Alice who did Morris's room. Let's send for no, her. No, that is unnecessary. She was frightened of the idea of going in. I told her she need not and said I would clean up the room and put everything to rights myself. I'm quite sure that she has not been in this morning. What are we to do, Mother? Well, you must do exactly what you think fit. Doctor... Is it possible that Morris can have died from chloralin poisoning? I have told you that I am satisfied that death was due to natural causes. I wasn't asking that. Yes, of course it's possible, but I don't for an instant believe it. I know that this must add awfully to your grief, Mrs. Tabret. I can't tell you how sorry I am. It seems dreadful that I should have to repay all your kindness to me by increasing your troubles. My dear... I'm quite ready to believe that you'll do nothing and say nothing but what you think is right. I'm all confused. It's come as such a dreadful shock. Nurse, do you really think that Morris died of an overdose of his sleeping draught? I do. It's awful. I think I should tell you that when I found the tablets were missing, I looked in the glass in which I dissolved the one I'd prepared for him. There was still about a dessert spoonful of liquid in the bottom of it. I have put it aside... And I suggest that it should be analysed. You are wasted in your profession, Nurse Wayland. You have all the makings of a detective. But wouldn't a draught in which half a dozen tablets had been dissolved be very unpalatable? Oh, it would be rather bitter. I suppose if one swallowed it down at a gulp, one would hardly notice until one had already drunk it. It all sounds very circumstantial. I'm afraid there's a dreadful probability in Nurse Wayland's story. But, my dear, it's absurd... Who on earth would have thought of murdering Morris? Oh, that, yes. I wasn't thinking of that. Nurse Whalen can't seriously think that anyone deliberately gave Morris an overdose of his sleeping draught. But I'm beginning to be desperately afraid that perhaps he took it himself. Suicide? He wasn't himself last night. He was very strange. I'd never seen him so nervy. Was there any reason for that? I'm afraid so. 
You see, I'd been to Tristan, and we'd seen it together the night we got engaged. It upset him to think of the past. Did he speak of suicide? No. Has he ever done so? Never. I don't believe it had entered his head. What made you think he was upset last night? He did a thing he'd never done before. He cried. He cried in my arms. Why, exactly? Really, Nurse Wayland. There are some things I can't tell you. What passed between my husband and myself was between ourselves. It concerned nobody but us. I beg your pardon. I should have thought it better for your own sake, to be frank. What do you mean? Are you accusing me of holding something back? I'm not accusing anybody. Stella, my dear, I won't ask you anything that is painful for you to answer. But there is just this. If there's anything in what Miss Whelan says, I suppose there'll have to be an inquest. The coroner will certainly ask you if your husband said anything at all that might indicate that suicide was in his mind. He said it would have been better if the accident had killed him outright. But he wasn't thinking of himself. He was thinking of me. That's very important. Oh, nurse, don't be hard on us. Don't be vindictive because I've been rather sharp with you. My nerves are all on edge today. After all, it's rather natural, isn't it? If poor Morris did take an overdose of something, can't you square it with your conscience to say nothing about it? He had so little to live for. Can't you spare us the distress and horror of a post-mortem and an inquest? The question is if Dr. Harvester is still willing to sign the death certificate. I think Nurse Whalen may very well have been mistaken about the tablets. I can see no reason why I shouldn't. But you see, I'm quite convinced that Morris Tabret did not commit suicide. For what reason? Well, here's one of them. Yes? There was a little liquid still in the glass from which he drank, about a dessert spoonful. You remember I mentioned that? Yes. Surely, if a man were going to commit suicide, he would drink the entire contents of the glass, either in one gulp or two. He wouldn't risk making a bad job of what he was about by leaving something at the bottom, least of all a man like Maurice Tabrit. That seems very far-fetched to me. I must say, it seems rather a small point. Besides, the stuff hasn't been analysed yet. Is your conviction based on nothing more than that? No, Ms. it Whelan? is not. Although Maurice Tabrit was very good, and I didn't believe he would ever take a tablet without leave... One knows that it's very easy to get into the habit of drug-taking, and then you can't be certain about anyone. Isn't that so, Dr. Harvester? Yes, I suppose it is. Sometimes he was terribly depressed. I didn't think it wise to let him have within reach the power of putting an end to himself. I never saw him depressed. I know you didn't. You never saw anything. Nurse Wayland, what have I done to you? Why do you talk to me like that? Your face is all twisted with hate of me. I don't understand. I'm beginning to be frightened of you. What sort of a woman are you that we've had in this house for five years? Now, there's nothing to be frightened of, darling. Because he joked and laughed when you were there. Did it never occur to you that there were moments when he was overwhelmed with black misery? Poor lamb, why did he insist on hiding it from me? His one aim was to make his suffering easy for you to bear. Whatever pain he had, he hid from you so that you shouldn't have the distress of being sorry for you him. You make me feel that I was so cruel to him. Everything had to be hidden from you. When you were coming, the medicine bottles and the dressings had to be put away so that there should be nothing to remind you that there was anything the matter with you. I would willingly have done everything for him that you did. It was his most earnest wish that I shouldn't concern myself with the horrid part of his illness. That's true, nurse. I'm sure that Stella did Morris most good by answering him back in the same strain when he chaffed and when he laughed, laughing with him. I was nothing. I, I was only his paid nurse. He didn't try to hide from me the despair that filled his heart. He didn't have to pretend to me. He didn't have to be good-tempered or amusing. With me, he could be morose and he knew I wouldn't mind. He could quarrel with me and then say he was sorry if he'd hurt me and know that he couldn't hurt me. You only saw the white mask of the clown... I saw his naked, tortured, triumphant soul. What are you telling us, Nurse Wayland? I'm telling you the truth at last. I wonder if you know what strange truth it is. But, Nurse, what you've been saying suggests that he did at least have moments of despair when he must have thought of suicide. We know that he was overwrought last night. If his death was not due to natural causes, surely it's extremely likely that he brought it about himself. It was just one of those moments that I was on my guard against. 
The chlorine was kept in the bathroom on an upper shelf that he couldn't possibly have got at. I had to stand on a chair myself to reach it. If a man is determined to do a thing, he can often surmount difficulties that others would have thought insuperable. Ask Dr. Harvester if it would have been possible for Maurice Tabrit to cross the room and go into the bathroom and stand up on a chair. He had absolutely no power in the lower part of his body. His back was broken by the accident and the spinal cord terribly injured. But couldn't he have crawled into the bathroom? No. I'm bound to admit that is absolutely out of the question. If he'd got into the bathroom, couldn't he have fished down the bottle with a stick or something? Perhaps. Oh, why do you say that, Dr. Harvester? You know that he couldn't sit upright without help. I'm not so anxious to put the worst construction on everything as you seem to be, Nurse Wayne. And if he'd got the bottle down, how could he have put it up in its place again? Oh, after all, we don't know yet that Morris died of an overdose of chlorine. The matter can't be left like this, Harvester. I'm afraid there'll have to be an inquest. Yes, obviously I can't sign the death certificate now. I shall have to communicate with the coroner. I'm sorry, Dr. Harvester. I bet you are. I suppose you think it's very self-seeking of me not to want to be mixed up in a scandal. I suppose I ought to laugh at the prospect of smashing up a practice that I paid good money for and would have spent seven years in building up... Oh, come now. It's not going to be as bad as that. For a hopeless invalid to take an overdose of his sleeping draught is not so uncommon as to excite much comment. Dr. Harvester knows as well as I do that if Maurice Tabrit died of an overdose of chlorine, he couldn't have taken it himself. There's only one word for it, and you all know it. It's murder! I'm absolutely convinced that he died of natural causes. I can't offer an explanation of the disappearance of those blasted tablets, but there must be an explanation. The most likely one is that Nurse Wayland was mistaken. And surely it's only reasonable to suppose that if anyone had taken out half a dozen tablets, he would have put others in their place. Aspirin or chloride of potash or something, so that they wouldn't be missed. People don't think of everything. It's only because a murderer makes some mistake that he's caught. But hang it all, no one commits a murder without a motive. No one had the smallest reason to wish Morris dead. How do you know? Oh, good Lord, how do I know that two and two are four? I know that everybody was devoted to him. And with reason. He was the best fellow in the world. Did you know that his wife was going to have a baby? <sighs> you fiend. Stella. I suspected it last night when she nearly fainted. This morning, I knew for certain. What do you mean? Are you accusing me of having murdered my husband? Is it true what she says, Stella? It's quite true. I'm in a very false position... I'm conscious that I'm interfering in matters that are no affair of mine. My dear Major, I know that your kindness itself. You've known Mrs. Tabret for ages and Morris and Colin when they were small boys. All the same, you must see how difficult it is for me to ask the question that inevitably rises in one's mind. I'll answer without your asking. Of course, it's quite impossible that Morris should have been the father of the child I'm going to have. I am the father. Mr. Collin, you? Do you mean to say that it escaped your sharp eyes, nurse, that Colin and Stella were in love with one another? Did you know? I think nowadays the young are apt to think their elders even more stupid than advancing years generally make them. Oh, Mother, what must you think of me? Do you very much care? I suppose I ought to be terribly ashamed of myself. I must be sincere. I don't want to make a pretense of remorse that I don't feel. I can no more help loving Colin than I can help the rain falling. I'm proud of the child he's given me. You're shameless. But you, Mother, you have every right to think that I treated Morris abominably. He's beyond the reach of pain. But I bitterly regret the pain I've caused you. I have no excuses to make for myself. My dear... Don't you remember what I said to you last night? I thanked you for all that you'd done for Morris. Did you think I was talking at random? I knew then that you were going to have a baby and that Colin was his father. Mother, you... I blame myself so awfully. You mustn't do that, darling. If a woman doesn't want a man to make love to her, she can very easily prevent it. I didn't prevent Colin from making love to me because I wanted him to. I made him love me. Oh, Stella, how could I help loving you? I don't blame myself for that. I blame myself because when I knew I loved you, I didn't go away again. Whatever you may think of me, Mother, and however badly you think I've behaved, I ask you to believe that I didn't give myself to Colin to gratify any passing whim. 
I loved him with all my heart. My dear, I know. You say you made him love you. Well, why do you say that except that you love him so much? You mustn't think I didn't struggle against it. I told myself that Morris was a cripple, bedridden, sick, the victim of an unforeseen misfortune. I tried to drive Colin away. I did everything except ask him to go. I couldn't do that. I couldn't. I pretended to myself that it was on your account and on Morris's. You hadn't seen him for so long. Morris was so pleased to have him here. Yes, it's quite true that I hadn't seen Colin for a long time. And Morris was tremendously pleased to have him here. Oh, I don't understand you, Mrs. Tabbridge. You seem to be going out of your way to find excuses for your daughter-in-law. If you knew what was going on, why didn't you stop it? Well, I'm afraid that I shall shock you, Miss Wayland. I want to put it as delicately as I can, but it is a matter that we English have made indelicate by prudishness and hypocrisy. Stella is young, healthy and normal. Why should I imagine she has not got the instinct that I had at her age... The sexual instinct is as normal as hunger and as pressing as the desire to sleep. Why should she be deprived of its satisfaction? It seems to me that the modern world is obsessed by sex. After all, the answer is that you can't go without food and you can't go without sleep, but you can go without the satisfaction of your sexual appetites. Mm, But at what price of nervous disorders and unhealthy emotions? When Morris's accident made it impossible for him and Stella ever to live again as man and wife... I asked myself if she would be able to support so false a relationship. They had loved one another as two healthy young things do love. Their love was deep and passionate, but it was rooted in sex. It might have come about with time that it would have acquired a more spiritual character, but they didn't have the time. May I ask how long you'd been married? I was married to Morris about a year before he crashed. A year? A whole year. Out of his suffering, a new love did spring up in Morris's heart. A hungry, clinging, dependent love. I didn't know how long Stella would be content with that. I knew that her pity was infinite. I knew it was so great that she mistook it for love. And I prayed that she would never find out her mistake. She meant everything in the world to Morris. At first it was easier when we were struggling for his life, but when he settled down to being a chronic invalid and we knew that he would never be anything else, I was seized with a great fear. I feared that the time would come when she felt she couldn't stand any longer the miserable life that was all he had to offer her. If she wanted to go, I felt we hadn't the right to prevent her, and I knew that if she went... Morris would die. I would never have left him. It never entered my head that it was possible. I saw the strain that it began to be on her nerves. She was as kind as ever and as gentle, but it was an effort. And what is the good you do worth unless you do it as naturally as the flowers give their scent? I've never been given to understand that good is only good if it's easy to do. No, I don't suppose it is. But if it's difficult, then I think it benefits the person who does it rather than the person it's done to. That is why it is more blessed to give than to receive. Oh, I don't understand you. I I think that what you say is odious and, and cynical. Oh, and I'm afraid that you'll think what I'm going to say is even more cynical and odious. I find myself half wishing that Stella should take a lover. Mrs. Tabrit. I was willing to shut my eyes to anything so long as she stayed with Morris. I wanted her to be kind and thoughtful and affectionate to him, and I didn't care about the rest. I had such a deep respect for you, Mrs. Tabrit. I admired you so much. I, I used to think that when I was your age, I'd like to be a woman like you. When Colin came back, and after a while I realized that he and Stella were in love with one another, I did nothing to prevent the almost inevitable consequences. I didn't deliberately say it to myself in so many words. That would have shocked me. But in my heart, there was a feeling that this would make it all right for Morris. She wouldn't go now. She was bound to this house by a stronger tie than pity or kindness. But, Millie, didn't it strike you what great dangers you were exposing them to? I didn't care. I only thought of Morris. When they were children, I think I loved them equally, but since his accident, I haven't had room in my heart for anyone but Morris. He was everything to me. For him, I was prepared to sacrifice Colin and Stella. 
I hope you'll forgive me. Oh, my dear, as though there were anything for me to forgive. You'll only laugh at me if I say I'm shocked. I can't help it. I'm shocked to the very depths of my soul. Mm, I was afraid you would be. I would have gone to the stake for my belief that no unclean thought had ever entered your head. Didn't it revolt you to think that your son's wife was having an affair with a man under your roof? Well, I suppose I'm not very easily revolted. I've lived too long abroad to think that my own standard of right and wrong is the only one possible. Perhaps we should all look upon these matters very differently if our moral rules hadn't been made by persons who had forgotten the passion and the high spirits of youth. Do you think it's so very wicked if two young things surrender to the instincts that nature has planted in them? Did the probable result never occur to you? A baby? Well, it persuades me of Stella's essential innocence. Otherwise, she would have known how to avoid such an accident. You must admit, at all events, that Morris's death has come in the very nick of time to get her out of a very awkward predicament. Nurse, what a cruel... What a heartless thing to say. You must be very careful, nurse. That sounds extremely like an accusation. I wanted to accuse nobody. Oh, do me the justice to admit that I started by saying that I was not satisfied with the circumstances and thought there should be a post-mortem. That was my right and my duty. Isn't that so, Dr. Harvester? I suppose it is. You forced me to this. You asked me who could have a motive for murdering Maurice Tabrit. In self-defence, I was obliged to tell you that his wife was going to have a child, of which he couldn't possibly be the father. You talk of your duty, Miss Wayland. Are you sure that your motive for all this is anything more than your bitter hatred of me? Why should I hate you? Believe me, I only despise you. You hate me because you were in love with Morris. I... How dare you say that? You gave it away. It had often seemed to me that you were fonder of Morris than a nurse generally is of her patient, and I used to chaff him about it. It never struck me that it was serious till this morning. You were madly in love with Morris. And if I was, what of it? Nothing, except that it's my turn to be shocked. I think it was rather horrible and disgusting. Yes. Yes. I loved him. Because he was so helpless and so dependent on me. I loved him because he was like a child in my arms. I never showed him my love. I would sooner have died. And I was ashamed because sometimes I thought in spite of everything he saw it. But if he saw it, he understood and was sorry for me. He knew, he knew how bitter it is to long for the love of someone who has no love to give you. My love meant nothing to him. He had no room in his heart for any love but the love of you. And you had no use for it. You think you were so kind and considerate. If you'd loved him as I loved him, you'd have seen how less than nothing was all that you did for him. I could think of a hundred ways to give him happiness, and you, you hadn't the love to think of one. Miss Wayland, I'm sorry for what I said just now. It was stupid of me. I suppose there is something beautiful in love of whatever kind it is. Will you let me thank you for the love you gave my husband? No. It's an impertinence to offer me your thanks. I'm sorry you should think that. It's quite true that I didn't love Morris, at least not with the love of a woman for a man. I often reproached myself because I couldn't. It seemed so ungrateful and so unkind. He was no more to me than a very dear friend for whom I was desperately sorry. Do you think he wanted your pity? I know he didn't. But pity was all I had to give him. Who was it said that pity was akin to love? There's all the world between them. Yes, all the hideousness of sex. And do you believe there was nothing of sex in your love for Morris? It was because I felt that there was in it an abnormal, aborted sexuality that at the first moment it gave me a little shiver of repulsion. No. No, my love for that poor boy was as pure and as spiritual as my love for God. There was never a shadow of self in it. My love was compassion and Christian charity. I never asked anything but to be allowed to serve and tend him. I never touched his lips till they were cold in death. And now I've lost everything that made life lovely to me. What was he to you? What was he to his mother? To me, he was my child, my friend, my lover, my God. And you killed him! That's a lie! Come, Nurse Wayland. You have no right to say that. It's true, and you know it. I know nothing of the kind. 
I only know that you've worked yourself into a state in which you're saying all sorts of things for which you have no justification. My dear, I could no more have killed Morris than I could walk a tightrope. Doesn't it occur to you that there was nothing to prevent my leaving him? Who could have blamed me? Oh, how could you have lived? You haven't a penny of your own. I've heard you tell Morris a hundred times that you had to mind your P's and Q's because he was your only means of livelihood. I certainly shouldn't have repeated a feeble little joke so often. I suppose I could have worked. You? Do you know what it means to work for one's living? Do you think one doesn't often feel tired and ill but goes on because it's one's job? Do you think one doesn't want to go and have fun like other girls? All your life you've been petted and pampered and spoiled and... And you were going to have a child. How could you have worked? You're really going too far, Miss Wayland. We can't stand here and let you insult Stella. There was Colin, you know, Miss Wayland. I don't think he would have left me in the lurch. He certainly wouldn't. And what would you have had to go through before he could marry you? Not only exposure to your husband, but the divorce court. It wouldn't have been a pretty case. It would have been horrible. Do you think his love would have stood the test? Are you sure he wouldn't have hated you for the disgrace you'd thrust upon him? Men are sensitive, you know, more sensitive than women, and they're afraid of scandal. I may not be typical of my sex. I don't think I should like it either. You don't have to tell me that. Why are you letting me stand here and talk? Unless you think you can persuade me or, or bribe me into holding my tongue. Why haven't these men who are your friends and who hate me thrown me out? Because they're afraid of me. They're afraid of scandal. They're afraid of publicity. Isn't that true? Very probably. And you're not only afraid of scandal, you're afraid of your neck. No, that's not true. You were in a hopeless situation. There was only one way out of your difficulties. You know as well as I know that your treachery, your, your cruelty would have broken your husband's heart. You couldn't face that. You preferred to kill him. You've known me for five years, Nurse Wayland. I don't know how you can think me capable of such wickedness. Your husband trusted and loved you. He was bedridden. He was defenceless. I know that if you'd had a spark of decent feeling, you couldn't have treated him as you did. If you were capable of being unfaithful to him, you were capable of killing him. Are you not falling into rather a vulgar error, my dear? I know that when people talk of a good woman, they mean a chaste one. But isn't that a very narrow view of goodness? Chastity is a very excellent thing, but it, it's the whole of virtue. There's kindness and courage and consideration for others. I'm not sure if there isn't also humour and common sense. Are you defending her for having been untrue to your son? I'm excusing her, Nurse Wayland. I know she gave Morris all she could. The rest was not in her power. Oh, I know how you look upon these things. Nothing matters very much. There's no guilt in sin and no merit in virtue. May I tell you a little story about myself? When I was still a young woman with a husband and two children, I fell madly in love with a young officer who had charge of the police in my husband's district, and he fell madly in love with me. Really? I'm an old woman now, and he's an elderly retired major. But in those days, we were all the world to one another. I didn't yield to my love on account of my boys. It nearly broke my heart. Now, you know, I'm very glad I didn't. One recovers from the pain of love. When I look at that funny old-fashioned major now, I wonder why he ever excited in me such turbulent emotions. I could have told Colin and Stella that in 30 years it wouldn't matter much if they'd resisted their love. But people don't learn from the experience of others. But you did resist. Well, I think it was easier then, you know. For in that far distant time we attached more importance to chastity than we do now. Yes, I resisted. But because I know the anguish it was, I feel that I have the right to forgive those who are less virtuous or perhaps only more courageous than I. Oh, my dear, you're so kind and so wise. No, darling, I'm only so old. Stella, Miss Wayland's accusation is very definite and must be met. Her accusation is absurd. Can you suggest anyone who had the slightest motive for wishing Morris was dead? No. Now, I'm sure you want to help us to get at the truth... You must forgive me if I ask you some embarrassing questions. Of course. What did you propose to do when you discovered you were going to have a baby? I was frightened. At first I couldn't believe it. I didn't know what to do. Did you tell anyone? No. 
I was trying to screw up courage to ask Dr. Harvester what I'd better do. I didn't mind for myself. It was Morris I was thinking of. You must have had some plan. Oh, a hundred. I thought of nothing else, day and night. I suppose you never thought of making a clean breast of it to Morris. No, never. It would have broken his heart. He would have forgiven me. He loved me so much. But I couldn't bear that he should lose that immense belief he had in me. It meant everything to him. You appear to have been the last person who saw him alive. Why was he upset last night? Oh. Need I tell you? It was so very private. No. No, no, of course not. I have no right to ask you anything. Only there's something very strange about the whole thing. And for your own sake, I think it would be better if you told us everything. He... He broke down because he couldn't love me as he wanted to love me. He would have so liked to have a child. And when you said good night to him, did he make no further reference to that? No, none. He'd quite recovered... He was in perfectly good spirits again. What did he say? He just asked me if I felt better. And then he said, you'd better get off to bed. And I kissed him and said, good night, darling. How long were you in his room? Five minutes. Did he say that he felt sleepy? No. I suppose you knew where the chloralin was kept? Vaguely. I knew that all his bottles and things were in the bathroom. He hated his bedroom to be listed about. Did he ask you for anything before you went? No. There was nothing he wanted. Nurse Wayland had fixed him up quite comfortably. You don't understand. Major Lecondre is giving you an opportunity of saying that your husband asked you for the chloralin, and you, thinking no harm, gave it to him. You saw him take out five or six tablets, and then you replaced the bottle on the shelf. I never thought of that. That would have been quite a good way out if I'd poisoned my husband. No, Major. Morris never asked me for the chloralin, and I never gave it to him. May I ask a question now? Certainly. Why were you so upset when I came in this morning and told you I'd been into your husband's room? When you said he was dead. No, you didn't know he was dead then. You couldn't have known, unless you had second sight. Oh, I see what you mean now. I was angry with you for going into his room before he was called. Are you sure you weren't afraid I'd gone into his room too soon? Supposing he'd been still alive and it had been possible to save him quite made up your mind that I murdered Morris, haven't you? I'm not the only one. What makes you think that? Why do you suppose the Major gave you that loophole by suggesting that your husband asked you to give him the tap? You've done what you thought your duty, Miss Wayland, well and good. If now you have other things to do, I don't think we need take up any more of your time. I'll go. There's nothing more for me to do here. I know you all hate me and you think I've done what I've done from unworthy motives. I started packing my things this morning. I shall be ready in ten minutes. Well, you must take your time, nurse. Mrs. Tabret, I couldn't go without thanking you for all your kindness to me during the five years I've lived here. My dear, you were never any trouble. It was never difficult to be kind to you. I'm dreadfully sorry to have to repay all you've done for me by bringing this confusion and unhappiness upon you. I know you must hate me. It seems frightful, but I do ask you to believe that I can't help myself. Oh, before we part, my dear, I would like to say... God bless you for the kindness you showed my poor Morris and for the unselfish love you bore him. Oh, I'm so desperately unhappy. Now, my dear, you mustn't lose your admirable self-control. Miss Wayland, I suppose you'll leave an address. Dr. Harvester will communicate with the proper authorities and I've no doubt they will want to get in touch with you. I shall go and see the coroner and put the facts before him. Would you like to come with me, nurse? No. Well, if Mrs. Tabret doesn't mind, I'll ring up his place from here and find out if he's in. No, of course I don't mind. But before you do that, may I say something? Of course. I'll try to be brief. Nurse Wayland is mistaken in thinking that Stella was the last person who saw Morris alive. I saw him and spoke to him later. You? But was he wide awake? If he'd taken 30 grains of chloralin, he'd have been certainly very drowsy, if not comatose. Wait a moment, Dr. Harvester. Let me tell you my story in my own way. I beg your pardon. You know that Morris's room was just under mine. Well, his windows were always wide open, and when he couldn't sleep and put on his light, I could see the reflection from my window. Then I used to slip down and sit by him, and we'd put out the light and talk. He'd tell me of his great love for Stella 
and how anxious he was for her welfare and happiness. We talk of the mystery that surrounds the life of man, and often he would fall asleep and I stole softly away. We never mentioned these long conversations we had. I didn't want Stella to think that I was in any way taking her place. My dear, I wouldn't have grudged you anything. There was no need to. I couldn't sleep last night. There was no light in Morris's room, but I felt strangely that he was lying awake too. So I went downstairs and into the garden and looked in at his window. He saw my shadow and he said, Is that you, Mother? I thought you might come in. What time was that? I don't know. Perhaps an hour after you'd left. He told me that he'd taken his sleeping draught, but it didn't seem to be having any effect. He said he felt awfully wide awake. And then he said, Mother, be a sport and give me another. It can't hurt. Just for once, and I do so want to have a decent sleep. Yes, he, he was very nervy last night. I suppose his usual dose wasn't any good. Very early after his accident, I had promised Morris that if life became intolerable to him, I would give him the means of putting an end to it. And sometimes he would say to me, Does the promise still hold? And I answered, Yes, dear, it holds. Did he ask you last night? No. What happened then? I knew that Stella's love meant everything to Morris. And I knew that she had none to give him because she'd given all her love to Colin. What do we, any of us, live for but our illusions? And what can we ask of others but that they should allow us to keep them? It was an illusion that sustained poor Morris in his sufferings, and if he lost it, he lost everything. Stella had done as much for him as even I, his mother, could ask of her. I was not so selfish as to demand from her the sacrifice of all that makes a woman's life worth living. Why didn't you give me the chance? Years ago, when for my son's sake I put aside the great love I bore to that funny old major standing there, I thought that no greater sacrifice could ever be asked of me. I know now it was nothing. For I loved Morris. I adored him. I am so lonely now that he is dead. It was a lovely dream that he dreamed, and I loved him too much to let him ever awake from it. I gave him life, and I took life away from him. Mrs. Tabrit, it's impossible. How dreadful. I went into the bathroom, and I climbed on the chair and got the bottle of chlorolin. I took five tablets, as you know, Nurse Wayland, and I dissolved them in a glass of water. I took it into Morris, and he drank it at a gulp. But it was bitter. He mentioned it, and I suppose that's why he left a little at the bottom of the glass. I sat by his bed, holding his hand, till he fell asleep. And when I withdrew my hand, I knew it was asleep from which he would never awake. He dreamed his dream to the end. Oh, Mother, Mother, what have you done? And what will be the end of this? Oh, my dear, don't bother about me. What I did, I did deliberately, and I am quite ready to put up with the consequences. It's my fault. How can I ever forgive myself? What have I done? You mustn't be silly and sentimental. You love Colin, and Colin loves you. You mustn't think about me, nor distress yourselves at what happens to me. You must go away. And in America, you can marry and have your child, and you must forget the past and the dead. For you are young, and the young have a right to life, and the future belongs to them. Mother, darling. Oh, Mother, you make me so ashamed. My son... I love you, too. I have your happiness very much at heart. Millie. Oh, my dear, dear Millie. Well, Nurse Wayland, you see, you were quite right. Of course, I ought to have replaced the tablets by others, aspirin or chlorate of potash. But as you said just now, murderers often make mistakes, and I am not an habitual criminal.
Dr. Harvester, are you still willing to sign the death certificate? Yes. Then sign it. If there were ever any question, I'm prepared to swear that I left the tablets on Morris's table by his bed. Nurse Wayland. Isn't it a dreadful risk that you're taking, Doctor? I don't care. Nurse, we're so grateful to you. So infinitely grateful. Oh, Mrs. Tabret. I've been petty and revengeful. I never knew how mean I was. Oh, come, come, my dear. Don't let any of us get emotional. We are both of us lonely women now. Let us help one another. So long as you and I can keep our love for Morris alive in our hearts, he is not entirely dead. In the Sacred Flame by Somerset Maugham, adapted for radio by Peter Watts, you heard Sybil Thorndyke as Mrs. Tabret, Jill Balkan as Nurse Wayland, and Carlton Hobbs as Major Leconda. Dr. Harvester was played by Stephen Jack, Morris by John Graham, Stella by Pat Pleasance, Colin by Dennis Gocher, and Alice by Joe Manning Wilson. The recorded production was by Graham Gold. This play will be repeated on Monday afternoon at 3.15 in the home service. <laughs>